Hi, everyone. I'm very glad to be here. I think I'm an out-of-the-box selection for this, so I just feel privileged to be able to come. And uh, uh, people weren't too interested in me until I um, uh, <laughs> Uh, divulged that I collaborate with one of my panelists and uh, which with a quite an innovative program and that's sort of how I got here I think. Um, so I'm a family doc. I um, believe in the uh, right to food. I believe in the right to health care too. I believe in a lot of things but um, and um, <laughs> uh, but particularly in my life, I really believe in primary prevention. I'm a little tired of giving medicines. I'd rather have people eat whole food. I'm sure that resonates with all of you. Uh, and what you might not know is, you know, how big an impact, and maybe you do, the social determinants of health are. And so what we mean by that is how poverty impacts health, for instance, or how. Um, uh, food insecurity impacts health, and and the truth is, is that probably uh, that that about half of the term determinants of health are related to those kind of issues. Some is related to genetics. Some things we can't change, but some, but really, it's the these social determinants of health that uh, make up about half of our health risk. So this is really important to me, especially when you look at the health system and realize that. Probably close to 90% of what we spend in healthcare is on medical intervention. It's not on any of this. So, so the work that we do, um, breaking out and doing um, new innovative projects where we bring uh, farm shares into our medical homes is really uh, important work and, and resonates in my heart, basically. So I'm glad to be here. Um, I do believe also in food systems and I believe in uh, just saying the same thing until we change the system and um, being vocal. I, um, I, I um, work really closely in, in with uh, my patients. You know, I do a lot of direct patient care still. We are in what are called medical homes, so we have, you know, dietitians and all these new resources. But what we're really pushing out to is this concept of looking at systems, at like public health rather than just population um, health of the diabetes, but really public health. We probably don't need safe water in the United States or in Colchester, Vermont, where I live, but there are other things that we can do. So um, my panel, or mine, it's mine, <laughs> is on the behavioral and cultural considerations in the right to food. And so um, what we have are three great presentations on, on um, new concepts and new innovations in in the right to food, and um, so each of these uh, folks are going to have 15 to 20 minutes to present on their project, and then we will have time for a panel discussion. Uh, so uh, we have three main topics, are food safety, food system distribution and teaching, that's how I'm assessing yours, Paul, and then food sovereign sovereignty. So let me introduce our first panelist, and that is Ashley Chaffetz. She came from North Carolina, and um, this is not her first time in Vermont, just in case you didn't know. Um, she researches domestic and food and agricultural policy, and she focuses on policies and regulations, or lack thereof, that regard food safety and the inequality of goods available to and demanded by socioeconomically diverse communities. So she recently completed her PhD in public policy at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and her dissertation was called The Food Safety Policy Gap, Essays on Emergency Food in North Carolina. And it evaluated the channels of distribution for those who seek emergency food, specifically the supply chains, the organizational readiness, and standard operating procedures of North Carolina's 2,500 food pantries. So I'm looking forward to hearing her work, and please help me welcome Ashley Chaffetz. Um, so this, okay, so this uh, presentation is actually one part of a much bigger project, um, namely my dissertation um, that looks at uh, North Carolina's emergency food system. Um, and I think as we, uh, thinking about the stuff that was already mentioned today, um, 
in my brain, there's not just a right to food, but a right to safe food. Um, this research examine, examines the disparities in food safety based on the idea that everyone deserves safe food, not only those who are paying for their food. Um, and does everyone, and the question, does everyone have access to safe food? So since 2008, approximately 14.5% of Americans are considered to be food insecure. Um, but in North Carolina, these rates are even higher. Um, the overall food insecurity rate for North Carolina is about 19.3%, with the child food insecurity rate of 27.3%. Um, parts of the state are even worse. Um, uh, in some counties, there are up to 35% of children who are considered to be food insecure. And while government assistance is available to some, it is not sufficient for many families, um, leaving them to seek out emergency food providers. Um, the previous talk actually set this up very nicely. Um, so, but the number of emergency food providers is constantly changing. Um, there are about 2,500 emergency food providers in North Carolina. Um, and these are pantries, shelters, backpack programs, after school programs. Um, and they are partnered with seven regional food banks. Um, According to the, these, four, these food banks are partnered with uh, Feeding America, which is the, lar the nation's largest uh, hunger relief charity. Um, there's an estimated hundreds more um, independent food pantries outside of that uh, Feeding America network. We don't actually know how many food pantries there are to the point where uh, folks at the food banks have asked me if I know, because I've been doing the research. Um, emergency food, uh, is the overarching term that we use for the foods that are distributed through the shelters, food banks, pantries, soup kitchens, um, and other like institution-specific programs. Um, it's important that we know the difference between food pantries and food banks, and so for those of you who might not, um, a food bank is generally a large operation that stores and distributes food from producers, retailers, federal commodity programs, um, the food industry, to food pantries. And the food pantries are typically the distributors of emergency food at the local level. So if you are a person in need of food, you would go to a food pantry, not a food bank. The food bank provides to the food pantries, but not all of them. <laughs> Not to be confusing. <laughs> um, so each year, an estimated 48 million Americans contract foodborne illness. That's one in six people, so that's pretty much one person at each table. Um, and if we were to break that down in terms of um, number of people in North Carolina who get uh, foodborne illness every year, it's about 310,000. Um, some populations are more vulnerable. Um, those are kids, seniors, uh, people who are immunocompromised. Um, and it should also be remembered that about 46% of foodborne illnesses come from leafy greens, um, which we'll come back to in terms of my conversation here. So what's the issue in North Carolina? There's actually no policy that regulates the food pantries in North Carolina. Um, the food pantries operate in a, what we're going to call a regulatory desert. Um, the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Food Donation Act uh, alleviates liability for the donated foods. So pretty much it means that um, there's this federal rule of strict liability that a state can apply, and North Carolina has applied it, um, to, defect to the distributors of defective products when a defective aspect causes injury typically due to gross negligence or, or intentional misconduct or recklessness. So what this means is that uh, this uh, helps to encourage people to donate to the food pantries um, and to the food banks in this way. If you are a donor Owner to the food pantry and someone is later found to be sick from that product, it is not necessarily that you are liable as long as you gave it in good faith. Um, so this does not prohibit any specific foods for donation, um, given that they're assumed to be safe upon donation. So in North Carolina, given that there's no regulations, each pantry creates its own rules and regulations um, given that there's an absence of some, any that were created by the government. Um, some of those rules are formal and some of those rules are informal. Um, as a result of a lot of healthy eating efforts um, by experts at various levels, the food banks and pantries often encourage the donation and distribution of perishable goods. Um, some food banks and pantries, including some sampled in my research, also host community gardens, which also have varied food safety food safety guidelines. Um, 
This year alone, we, we've seen a staff outbreak at a homeless shelter where 55 people were infected in a food pantry in New York that was closed due to unsanitary conditions. And those are pantries in states where the pantries are regulated. Um, there's very little research that looks at the connection between food security and food safety. Um, and so if each of these 2,500 emergency food providers serves 50 people, which is a gross understatement, that's about 125,000 people that we're talking about on a regular basis. So I'm asking the question, are the foods kept safe enough to eat? Um, is the extra long supply chain increasing the risk for pantries? And do the pantry managers have the information necessary to keep that food safe? So of course, this data does not exist, so I had to collect this data. Um, but so the big questions that I'm going to answer today or try to is what are the entities that supply food pantries in North Carolina? What steps are taken by those different actors to lessen the risk? And uh, are some food pantries essentially safer than others? Um, and is it dependent on location, rural versus urban, or like those who partner with a food bank or what have you? Um, this is an exploratory project, meaning that like no one had really done this kind of research yet. So I had to go out there and find this data. So um, to analyze these emergency food providers, um, I collected data. Um, I used a stratified random sample based on food bank region and metro, metropolitan, micropolitan, and rural status. Um, so I visited food pantries in 12 counties. There are 100 counties in North Carolina. Um, six of those counties are part of metropolitan statistical areas. Four are part of micropolitan, and two don't actually fit either category. They're incredibly rural, but not adjacent to any metropolitan areas. Um, there were 282 food pantries in those 12 counties. Um, I can contacted all of them and ended up interviewing and observing at 105 of them. So this is actually a mixed methods product project, but I'm actually mostly going to talk about quantitative stuff. So I did this um, early last year. Okay, because there are no regulations, I apply a modified food establishment inspection report scoring scheme to the food pantries as a survey instrument, which means that um, I have this self-administered questionnaire that I ask all the managers, and I also uh, use essentially what the health inspectors use to uh, uh, look at their different practices. Um, so what I'm looking at are the sources and delivery methods of the foods, the kinds of foods, the storage and distribution procedures, the supplier requirements, the use of past state foods, and ask them information on recalls. Um, practices observed include behaviors on hand washing, bare hand contact with ready to eat foods, thermometer use, and general prevention of contamination. Um, most pantries have a uh, pantry or closet where they keep foods. Um, there's only about 3%, a little less, that are purely mobile markets. And then um, almost all pantries have refrigerators or freezers. That does not mean the space is unlimited. It just means that they have refrigerators and freezers. So there are a lot of descriptors that motivate this analysis. So I'm going to keep coming back to this same slide. 78% um, of the pantries that I interviewed distribute perishable goods in some capacity. 11.4 um, prepare food in addition to distributing perishable and non-perishable foods, and there were only a little less, around 8% that distribute non-perishable foods only. So when we think about like foods you give to a food drive, you typically give non-perishable foods, but most pantries are also giving out perishable items. Okay, so what we're looking at here are the, actually the kinds Oh, it's nice and big. OK. So are the kinds of foods that are getting distributed. And so of the 105 pantries, you can see here that there's like 85% uh, are giving out meat. And meat can include fish, poultry, uh, um, pork, what have you. Um, about 48% give out fresh dairy. There's a lot of box milk out there, but this is actually fresh milk, um, eggs deli meat, home canned items, which are especially risky, but I'm not going to spend time on that today, um, hunted game, um, bread and pastries, and then restaurant leftovers. Um, all of these kinds of foods have different storage needs, um, though for the most part, all perishable goods require cold storage. Um, meat tends to come to the pantries frozen, so it has to be kept frozen. Um, and the highest risk items are the perishable items that are not stored in a cold environment, but actually are stored in the pantry when they should be stored cold. 
Um, so of the 93 pantries that distribute fresh fruits and vegetables, about 28% store them just in the pantry itself and not in cold storage. Um, Zero pantry managers indicated that they stored meat just in the pantry, um, but some of them actually will leave the meat on the counter until it gets distributed. So they'll get it in from somewhere with the intention of giving it out that day so it just like remains out, which may or may not be problematic um, because it essentially starts defrosting. Um, with certainty, the clients that were in the metropolitan areas received a more diverse set of foods in the bags than the pantry than the uh, clients in the rural areas. Um, that is, the foods are likelier to come from various suppliers. Um, of the pantries that partner with a food bank, which is about 80, uh, I think it was 85% of the pantries I visit, 70% um, of them participate in at least one federal commodity program, usually TFAP or SNAP. And TFAP is the emergency food assistance program of the federal government. Um, TFAP can include fresh and frozen fruit and meat products, and a participating pantry must be able to take any, pantry, any items that they're given, and that means that they have to have a freezer. Okay, so in terms of storage options here, uh, the options are limited. They either distribute food immediately, they store it in a fridge or a freezer, sometimes it's a walk-in, um, they put it on the shelves to give out. Um, sometimes the food bank will offer full pallets of certain items from lemons to tomatoes to potatoes, um, but the managers will have to refuse them if they don't actually have the capacity to transport the pallet, distribute them before they perish, or store them. Okay, I'm gonna try and move faster. Um, so um, these are, oh, okay, so these are, I'm gonna skip this slide, but this is essentially looking at um, what food products and how they're stored. So the, the bright blue is that they're not distributed at all, um, and that the uh, orange on the right-hand side is actually that they are not stored and they're given immediately, um, which are usually the ones that we are most interested in here. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about traceability. So I would walk around the um, food pantries and ask them, I would pick up different items and ask them if they knew where does this come from and how did it get here. Um, and so most, I, most managers could answer, um, could answer this question of where it came from, except unless it was a canned good, um, which isn't totally shocking, um, but it was very hard for them to answer, how did it get here? And the question there is, um, is it, uh, were these foods uh, sitting in a hot car for a while? Was it in the back of a truck? Um, was it in a cooler, what have you? Okay, so this might actually be harder to see than I thought it would be. So what we're looking at is like, how those different foods get to the, get to the pantry and from where? So are they getting it from big box stores, grocery stores, gardens, and how does it get there? I'm gonna move forward because I know I'm low on time. So what I actually do is I create this risk framework to analyze how risky the different pantry operations are, but also to figure out what characteristics might influence them. Um, I came up with 30 different factors. Every pantry had at least one of these factors, and the most that any pantry had was 14. So what we're looking at, um, these are, they get added up to come up with a risk score. It's not weighted. So traceability is, can they trace where their food came from? Can they trace meat, vegetables, eggs, and dairy? Did they receive food safety training? Do they learn about food recalls? Do they know about recalls but have no recall plan? Do they have written standard operating procedures? Do they have written, do they have the operating procedures but they're not modeled? <laughs> Um, do they distribute, uh, I'm going to call them unregulated foods, but this would be food from gardens, the foods that are home processed, um, foods that are uh, like leftover prepared foods. Um, do they repackage foods on site? Do they handle ready to eat foods? Do they store food improperly? Like do they put frozen meat into the fridge and not the freezer? Um, do they not put eggs in the refrigerator? Um, do they know how foods get to the pantry? So I come up with this analysis, essentially saying that the risk score, um, a lower risk score is better, right, because you have fewer risks. Um, so if, you know, we're looking at food bank partnership, participation in these different federal programs, um, a vector of variables looking at food distribution. So these are, uh, do they pre-pack the items? Do they pack them as they go? Do they have a client choice model in the pantry? Which is essentially means that the clients come in, they shop like it's a grocery store, except that everything's free. 
Um, do they have a paid manager based on the idea that if someone is paid, then they're more regular um, and in charge and are able to uh, disseminate uh, formal rules? Do they have regular volunteers? So are they training new people to participate in the pantry every week? Um, do they have any sort of supplier requirements? Like do they ask those who are just giving them food any questions about that food? Um, and then uh, the vector of variables designating the type of food that is distributed. And this is only non-perishables, perishables and non-perishables, and perishables, non-perishables, plus they prep food on site. Um, for pre-packed items, the bags or boxes of food are packaged ahead of distribution rather than packing it as they go. Um, and so this is a, the risk score is essentially a count variable, um, and I use a uh, Poisson mo model to, uh, uh, no, sorry, I use a negative binomial model to actually do this uh, regression. So hopefully y'all are still following me. <laughs> so what I learned here is that in the first column, this is just all of the pantries, and this is actually really cool stuff. So um, this table represents the marginal effect. So this is like any, um, any greater effect um, of, the, of each of these characteristics. So what we learned is that the food bank partnership can increase the number of risks in this model, um, and it's statistically significant. Um, the result is hypothesized to come as a result of increased activities in general at the food pantries that partner with the food bank. However, participation in either TFAP or SNAP or both leads to an approximate decrease in risk of that score by 2.86, also statistically significant. So like what we're saying is that most foods pantries that partner with a food bank also participate in a food commodity program, and this dis dis this decrease becomes actually quite substantial. Um, food distribution practices revealed a relative statistical significance, both in process and in types of food. The client choice model uh, um, brought a decrease in 1.69 points compared to like packing as you go. Um, there was no significant effect for having re uh, regular volunteers or requirements by those who supply food. Um, the paid manager actually somewhat increase the score. Um, and in the second column, we look at the food bank partners only because they're such a great part of the, um, the uh, total sample and essentially says that their numbers are driving the sample, which isn't shocking given that they're a larger size. Okay, so what we learned <laughs> is that TFAP actually decreases your risk but food bank participation doesn't. What we know about TFAP is that there are a lot of rules with TFAP. Um, they have stringent rules and the food banks don't have the stringent rules, so it's not totally shocking that uh, it decreases the risk. The client choice model is essentially the less risky option because you're less likely to just be leaving your, uh, your food is less likely to be in the, um, in the pantry as long, I guess to say. Um, they, uh, the food remains in its stored location while people are shopping for it rather than taking it out and setting it on a table. Um, the pantries that distribute the non-perishables are only, are obviously the least risky, right? <laughs> um, but what it means is that it shows that federal regulation and any requirements to receive TFAP or SNAP actually decrease the other risk uh, factors. So even when the individuals face this like bureaucratic red tape to get TFAP, they actually continue through the process to pro procure food, which inevitably leads to these like safer practices. Sorry. Um, I question whether there should be like limited regulatory policy regarding time temperature control or supply chain, um, uh, not supply chain, uh, that time temperature control or proper storage could uh, make your supply chain safer. Um, but what so would also educational materials, which if any of y'all got to see what I wrote for the UVM uh, food feed blog, it, we created a whole series of educational materials essentially saying we don't necessarily need regulation, we just need uh, the pantry managers to have more information about how to properly store food and how to track it. Um, from a policy perspective, this paper, this research provides support for certain operating procedures over others. Um, and implies that there are these inequities in operating procedures across the pantries. Um, it did show that there was no statistical significance for urban versus rural pantries, that there was no real like, great difference in terms of how they operate. Um, while this analysis adds to the literature, it actually is saying like this research is incomplete. Um, 
there's, there are other parts that uh, add to it, and um, I'm happy to discuss those other parts of this research. Um, and I think that a comparative case study of high-risk items and their specific supply chains would allow for a richness that I can't provide in this like one study. And as explained by a pantry manager, uh, being admirable can be devastating. So I'm gonna leave that there and um, let the next speakers speak. Thank you, Ashley. Next we have Paul Feenan. He grew up in Bennington, Vermont. That's in the South, if you don't know. And uh, <laughs> um, after studying sustainable agriculture, community development, and getting his education at UVM and Evergreen State College, he says his real education took place in his own classroom when he was given the opportunity to teach alternative high school right, at, right out of college. Teaching is extremely important to Paul. He believes that his work in agriculture, ed education, and coaching has taught him exponentially more than he has taught his students. In particular, working with disadvantaged students and coaching high school basketball galvanized Paul's core values for working with people. Paul recently moved his family back to Vermont after having lived, worked, and farmed in western Washington state for the past 20 years. And he finds himself, I love this, lost on roads you used to remember. <laughs> but he's happy to be here, and we're happy to have you today. Please help me welcome Paul. Hello. Um, I'm the Food and Farm Program Director at the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps. Um, if, you, if you know Route 2 or 89 South, it's that big, red, beautiful barn with a not-so-big, not-so-red, beautiful barn next to it. Um, I'm really honored to be here talking about a project that we have worked so hard to um, to put together over the last four years. Um, and as I was preparing for this talk, you know, putting some final preparations on it last night, I, I, I finished up um, farming for the day and, and we, we kind of brainstormed, Shay and I, um, uh, what, what I was going to say. And, and I decided I was going to go eat a BLT. And so I went up and my son was eating a BLT, and there he is. He's the homely one of the two. Um, you should see the other one. She's really adorable. Um, and uh, he said, well, what are you doing? I, have to go I said, I have to go back and prepare for this big talk that I'm doing. And he said, well, what are you? Who? I said, I'm talking to a couple hundred people. He said, well, geez, aren't you nervous? And I said, well, no. You know, I'm, I, I, I was told to just picture them naked. And, and, he's, and he looked at me very uh, sheepishly and said, well, that's just weird. Uh, uh, you should picture them with a duck on their head <laughs> that is naked. So, so there you are. Um, uh, the, the number of people involved in this project is, is astounding. Many, many were part of the initial, initial design, and, and they're not here today. Um, some are at this conference shortly, and I think there's a few in the room. Uh, uh, the healthcare share also represents, um, like many things in Vermont, a really uh, incredible constellation of partners that have and continue to help broaden the scope of the project. Therein lies the unique evolution of this project. Um, from a local food access initiative to a comprehensive plan for community well-being, primary prevention, and the right to food. All these forces um, did something. All those up there you see, and, and more. They did something. They all threw their hat in the ring very early on in this project. There was a lot of trust, and there was a lot of risk associated with the, with the initial 
engagement in this project. And, and that seems really simple. But as I, look, I looked at uh, uh, the first time, quite frankly, I noticed on the bottom of this poster here, uh, solutions, action, amplified. And, and I hope you all take that home. I don't want to fail to, to make a point of this. Um, it seems really obvious, but as we all think and talk about this intense subject, the right to food, and we really mine down deep, uh, I want you to know that this happened here in Vermont because people decided to do something. So do something. Uh, don't wait for it to be perfect. Don't wait to have all the money from all the foundations on the planet. Definitely don't wait, never wait, to know what the outcome will be. Don't do that. Because we didn't know what the outcome of the health care share was going to be. Again, we thought it was going to be a solution to a farm and a nonprofit that serves youth um, where we could pay the youth to grow food and give the food away so that we didn't piss every other farmer off in Vermont because they didn't want the competition. That's really what we thought it was to begin with. And really, um, what I want to talk to you today about is, is some things that we really didn't know it was going to be. And that people, no one ever understands what it, what it is when I first explain it. And so it's really hard to explain in 15 minutes, so I'm going to keep going. Um, here's what it is in a nutshell. It's a CSA for people who can't afford it and, have, and or maybe have a diet-related illness. It's a partnership between a nonprofit that focuses on youth development and youth workforce development and personal development and medical centers. Central Vermont Medical Center in Berlin, UVM Medical Center here in Burlington, and I'm proud to say now Rutland Regional Medical Center in Rutland. Uh, medical providers identify patients that we know would benefit from increased consumption of healthy food. Families pick up their shares at their doctor's office, in essence receiving a prescription of vegetables and poultry from their doctor. We fundraise together, nonstop, unabashedly, unapologetically. We just take money from people's pockets <laughs> and then grow food with it with high school kids. Um, but we, the fundraising looks different at each hospital. Uh, uh, Central Vermont Medical Center has a payroll deduction. Doctors, nurses, uh, secretaries, uh, janitors all shave off a couple bucks out of every paycheck and buy a share for somebody that they know that's a patient. Um, at, at UVM, we go after big fat grants. Um, at Rutland Regional, that's what we did as well. Um, um, we're in the fourth year of the project. This year we're slated to serve 300 families, 1,200 individual family members from the farm at BYCC. And again, Rutland Regional Medical Center is providing 75 shares to area uh, families for the first time. I just got off the phone with Heidi Lynch, an alumnus from the farm at BYCC and a Rutland native. Um, she received funding earlier this year, late last year, um, uh, and started this program. She didn't wait. She really, quite frankly, didn't even wait for my permission, which I'm glad she didn't. But she just wrote a grant, she forced me to review it, and she put it in and she got it. And so now she's serving 75 families. She's calling it the Rutland Healthcare Share. It has nothing to do with the VYC, theoretically, except today she called me and said, oh, I just got a big uh, uh, dose of cash so we can hire youth from the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps. So we're going to have a crew of four kids and a crew later down there um, as of July 1st. So we need some kids down in Rutland. Um, so standing on its own two feet, the healthcare share is an amazing food access and nutrition program. And as I alluded to, we have come to find out that there's much more to the healthcare share than we realized when we began. And it is much more far reaching than what folks imagine when it is initially explained. The public health ramifications are elevated precisely because the healthcare share exists at the junction of those things, seven of them. I think we started with five at like eight o'clock last night, and we decided to add two more. Youth workforce development and training, increased access to local food, personal nutrition education, public awareness and involvement, 
preventative health care, leadership development, and market development. Increased access to local food. We're connecting people who aren't presently or weren't before at the table. They were not accessing this food. Youth workforce development. It's what we do at the VYCC. We never forget that. Um, our history, Tom Hark, uh, our founding president, started this organization 30 years ago this year with a $1 appropriation from the state. He's built it into a, an incredible model for youth development. Um, its mission is to teach individuals to take personal responsibility for all their actions. It has nothing to do with the environment. It has nothing to do with farming. It's about taking responsibility for yourself. Small groups of youth are guided by leaders, all working on a high-priority project. We're best known for trails. We're best known for forests. We're best known for picnic tables. We're best known for state parks. We're best known for river restoration. We're best known for disaster relief. The, where, where the farm is pertinent for this room is that our trail is food. Our project is the health care share. It's a CSA for people who can't afford it. Um, Youth are indispensable members of the health care share. They plant, harvest, and pack every share. They also, they're also recipients. We don't have very many youth working on the farm whose families could afford this food. Um, they bring it home to their families. I don't need to spell out what exactly happens here in regards to empowerment and self-esteem, personal development, and well-being ultimately well-being, leadership development. I've been doing this a long time, and I can tell you that this is a very special time in food and farming. I'm cool. And I was doing it a long time when I really wasn't cool. FFA, back 40 high school programs, stuck in the back of the, of the campus, working with kids who did not give a shit, did not care. Um, but now I have this tidal wave of passionate, smart, young professionals that are really chomping at the bit to get involved in food. And they need real opportunities to build skills to match their passion. That's not to say that their passion is skillless, but let's just be honest. We need to provide these people with real skills to match their passion. The, the healthcare share offers this opportunity. I believe that the result will be a development of a generation of leaders for the future of an agricultural economy in Vermont and beyond. Public awareness, masses of individuals and corporate sponsored volunteers help us grow this food. This project uh, offers many access points for contribution. Corporate sponsors, um, bring us hundreds and hundreds of workers every year and pay them to come work on the farm. Thereby involving many hands and people, raising awareness of the issue, that there are people that don't get to access, access the same food as others in Vermont, the self-proclaimed foodiest, farmiest place in the universe. Personal nutrition. In short, we grow and cook and teach young people to cook and feed themselves, and we pay them to do it. Preventative health care. I'm not a doctor. I don't play one on TV. But I do know that we have families picking up food from their doctor's office a minimum of 12 times a year, many of them more than that. There are doctors who are seizing on this opportunity. I would love to see more doctors seize upon this opportunity, to see their patients 12 times in about a three-month period. I don't know that that happens unless there's a real problem with someone otherwise. Um, there are a lot of hospitals in the world, and people eat lots of food in these institutions. Diane Embry, is Diane, Diane, are you here? Not here? She's probably doing something. Um, uh, she's a real pioneer, and what's going on at UVM Medical Center is not the norm. If you don't know what Diane is doing and, and you're interested in food and healthcare, you should really go ask somebody. Go ask her. Um, but, but there's a lot of hospitals out there that really uh, could use these relationships, these farm to institution relationships. So that's the market development piece. 
you know, when we bring bags and bags of food in to patients and they're carrying them around the hospital on a Wednesday or Thursday, it's really not uncommon for doctors and, and nurses and um, dietitians to start asking how they can get that food in their house. How can we get that food in our institution? So it's, it, it's really turned out to be a pretty unique backdoor market development opportunity for farms in Vermont. Okay, so we're all gonna go out and after this week, we're gonna do something. Except for me. Um, I just came from the fields. We are getting our asses kicked out there with this weather, you guys. You guys, if you guys have a farmer that you love, you should give them a hug, or as Shay said, give them a dry towel <laughs> right now, because we are getting buried by rain. Um, so really, honestly, this is really hard work this year. Uh, I'll, I'll, you very rarely hear me complain about farming, but it's, this is, it's, it's difficult, and it's difficult to get kids to do it. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to, to, to that, but I'm also in the fourth year of a project, and I need to ask and answer some really hard questions. I love donor meetings because I, I, have, a, I have a relationship with a network of donors that ask me hard questions. And, and those are questions that I take back to my team and say, we need to answer these questions. Um, and so the hard questions that I, I need to ask are, you know, are we, are we changing people's behaviors? Is this more than a flash in the pan fleeting project? And if it is, where will I find sustainable funding year after year? Sustainable, reliable funding year after year. For what? To pay for food and to pay the kids to grow it and to develop the leadership potential of a tidal wave of young professionals. How do we graduate participants from the project? There are so many questions, I really need help. Please help me. As my old man used to end every letter to me back when people wrote letters, um, work hard but safe, stay focused, send money, mom and dad. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thank you, Paul. And next we have Brittany Kesselman, who came, traveled a little further than Paul did. Um, over the past 10 years of practical experience in policy research and analysis in the field of development and, and conflict, she's now working on a PhD. It's on the contribution of food gardens to food sovereignty. And this helps her unite her passion for transforming the food system with her poly, policy experience. So when she's not working in a food garden, <clears throat> um, she's usually in the kitchen testing recipes for Josie Uncooked, a health food business that seeks to educate people about healthy and sustainable eating one meal at a time. Welcome, Brittany. Tell me where my slides are. Sorry, I'm a Mac user at the slideshow. <laughs> Great. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure and an honor to be with you here today. Um, I'm not confident in my ability to get through this topic in 15 minutes, so I'm going to dive right in, barrel through it, and then come back to things I may have missed or glossed over at the end if I make it there. Um, let me set my timer as well. So I'll be talking to you today about the contribution of urban community food gardens to food sovereignty in Johannesburg, South Africa. In the background of that slide, you see one of my case study gardens. Um, I'll very briefly go over my research, uh, the context in Johannesburg, some information about the policy environment and the actual government programs supporting urban agriculture in the city, um, an overview of some of the benefits of urban agriculture globally and specifically what's happening in Johannesburg, and finally, imagine an alternative approach based on food sovereignty. 
So basically what I'm trying to understand is, are food gardens contributing to food sovereignty in Johannesburg? And I'm sure most of you in the room are familiar with the concept of food sovereignty, but just to be sure that we're on the same page, what I mean is the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods, and their right to define their own food and agriculture systems. And the reason we're talking about food sovereignty uh, is because no less a personage than the former Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food said that food sovereignty is a condition for the full realization of the right to food. And unlike food security, which frequently takes a more narrow calorie counting approach to food, food sovereignty considers how food is produced, by whom, and who controls the food system. So essentially it brings the politics back in. Um, I might skip my research methods and come back to them later, just to be sure we have enough time. But broadly, I've been going around looking at gardens all over Johannesburg and then focusing my efforts in two case study gardens in poor areas of the city, doing work every week in these gardens, as well as uh, sort of a life history interview approach focusing on food and food diaries with all of the participants and then interviewing loads of other people and reading a great deal. So the city of Johannesburg uh, is located in South Africa, which is now 21 years old as a democracy. The city is the largest one in the country with 4.4 million people. It's located in the wealthiest and most urbanized province, which is called Gauteng. It is also the geographically smallest, but largest by population with about a quarter of the country's population, and that increases every day as people migrate in looking for work. There's a very high poverty rate in the city at over 20% of households, and I think it's higher now. Um, South Africa, unfortunately, is a world leader in inequality. We are usually number one. Occasionally, Brazil passes us, and then we overtake. Um, and unemployment is also extremely high. The latest figures for the city of Johannesburg are almost 25%, and that's a very conservative definition. It includes people who sell apples on the street corner, and it doesn't include people who gave up after they couldn't find a job. So obviously in a context of poverty and unemployment, it's not surprising to find food insecurity. Um, at national level, it's about a quarter of the population of South Africa that's food insecure, with a little more than the next quarter at risk of hunger. In the city, the numbers vary widely depending on the study um, and where they focused and which methods they used, but you find about 27% food insecurity citywide around 42% in poorer areas, and up to 90% food insecurity in the poorest areas. Drink some water. So in South Africa and in Johannesburg, the issues in terms of food security are not availability. There's more than enough food for everyone. The issue is access, and this is both spatial access and economic access to food. Um, there are also issues around dietary diversity and nutrition. You find that as in so many other places, people are eating incredibly unhealthy and monotonous, uh, high fat, high sugar, high salt diets. Uh, the graph you see here, the chart, is uh, covers two of the areas where my case study gardens are located. And in, in the inner city, you find about 61% food insecurity. And in Alexandra Township, where my other case study garden is, you find about 46% food insecurity. So it's not a pretty picture. Um, Wow, the animation works. Um, there's a sort of nested policy framework from national to provincial to local level. Uh, I'll just very briefly touch on a few key points. But most important um, to keep in mind at national level is that the right to food is in the South African Constitution. It's one of only about 20 countries that have it. It's been there since the democratic dispensation. And in theory, it informs all of the other government policies and programs around food. And I say in theory for reasons that we'll see. Um, at national level, there's a, an integrated food security and nutrition policy that's recently been developed. It's not really being implemented yet. The old policy has a similar name. Uh, it's largely about increasing agricultural production. So it's really addressing availability, which is not the problem. At provincial level, in the province of Gauteng, there's a 20-year food security plan. Um, most of the implementation falls under the Department of Agriculture, once again, and their two main programs are the Food Security Program and the Land Care Program, one of which focuses mainly on hunger and the other 
is focusing a bit more on sustainable management of agricultural land. There's not a great deal of agricultural land in a 96% urban province, but we do have some. Um, those two programs both give out tools, training, um, and provide extension officers to gardens in the city. At the city level, the city of Johannesburg has developed a food resilience policy. The city has no agricultural mandate whatsoever. They don't have a department of agriculture. So they've decided to address this anyway and put it under the Department of Social Development, which generally deals with social welfare. So the food resilience policy is fairly ambitious and seeks to address not only food gardens, but also safety nets and improving access to markets, leveraging government procurement, and ultimately subsidizing food. Most of these are fairly new and are not yet implemented, so while it's an ambitious program, we haven't seen much of it on the ground yet. Um, the city of Joburg's policy and programs are, are more impressive in terms of their complexity than the provincial and national ones, but at all levels there are challenges of targeting, and it tends to be the case that there are bureaucratic numeric targets, like the number of seeds distributed, rather than any kind of monitoring of impact on these, on these policies and programs. Uh, they also are very poorly resourced, so they're not able to meet demand in terms of the numbers of people who want assistance with seeds or training or access to land. Uh, and the support also can't last as long as it would need to, to ensure that gardens that are started are sustainable. Um, there's a frequent problem of poor communication between government officials and gardeners, which leads to a lot of mistrust and a lot of disappointment amongst the gardeners who get fed up with the government um, because of misunderstandings. And then a lot of the problems that the urban farmers face are actually outside of the garden gate. And so the policies are not always able to address those. In the city of Johannesburg, the transport system is quite poor and extremely expensive. So even if your garden is in the city, you may not be able to access markets beyond your immediate community to sell your vegetables. And then finally, the role of the state. So far, the government has conceived their role as just facilitating access to the existing food system for both producers and consumers. Um, and, and they've been reluctant to sort of intervene and seek to change that food system, which is highly concentrated, corporate controlled, and creating a lot of food insecurity. So it's just sort of tinkering at this point in time. Um, I'm talking about urban agriculture in general and looking at food gardens because in the literature, globally, there are so many benefits that are associated with urban agriculture. I've chosen about six that are linked to food sovereignty in some way or another, um, just to consider those ones for today. If you start at the top in the green bubble, the most obvious benefit is improved food security and nutrition. Obviously, the gardeners themselves have access to the vegetables that they grow, and usually their surrounding community does as well. Um, and then moving clockwise towards the purple, you also see improved livelihoods, either through savings on food purchases or income from the sale of vegetables, or occasionally through salaries if people get employed at the gardens. And then beyond that, there are a lot of potential environmental benefits, as we all know, um, in terms of things like nu uh, nutrient cycling and rainwater harvesting or use of gray water and reducing your food miles. And moving beyond that, um, there are sort of more less concrete benefits that are associated with food gardens, things like improving food democracy and food system localization, where control of food decisions gets brought down to the local level and into communities. Um, also transformation of the food system by providing an alternative to the extremely long food value chain, corporate controlled one that we mostly live in. And finally, a lot of studies have looked at the empowerment of women and how when women participate in urban agriculture, you frequently see economic empowerment, but also other kinds of empowerment and sort of consciousness raising that can translate into other areas of their lives. So in Johannesburg, the participation in urban agriculture is not very high. Um, it's about 9%, 5 to 9% estimate, depending on, on the studies you look at. There hasn't actually been a citywide survey. But to compare that to the rest of the region, the major cities in southern Africa, the average participation is about 22%. Uh, so in Johannesburg, it's less than half of that. And given the levels of poverty and unemployment and food insecurity, the question is why are people not growing food? And there are so many reasons, and many of them historic in the case of Johannesburg. But there are three themes that emerge. And uh, one of those is access to resources. And as Smitter 
reminded us earlier, people are denied access to resources. In South Africa, there's a long history of excluding people from access to land and water. And even after democracy, people haven't gotten that access back. Um, there's also a lack of interest in farming. Unfortunately, unlike here, Paul would not yet be cool in Johannesburg. We're, we're working on it, but so far, farming is still kind of dirty and not so cool and supposed to happen somewhere else. And finally, people don't know how to farm. Even the ones who come from rural areas have been dispossessed of their land for such a long time that there's not sort of a tradition of farming for everyone. Um, what I have found in terms of who is farming amongst those few who are doing it in the city is that there are more women than men. So these farmers that I'm talking about, they're women. Uh, they are generally not young people. I mean, we could probably use a youth conservation corps because most of them are, are pensioners. And they are generally not the very poorest or most food insecure, although the census data shows that at least half of agricultural households are below the poverty line. But the ones that I tend to encounter are certainly poor, but not the poorest of the poor. And then the question is, if there are all these amazing benefits associated with urban agriculture generally, are we seeing those benefits in Johannesburg? And so far, my research in my two case study gardens and around the city suggests that we are seeing some of them to some degree. Um, people do get some income from the gardens, though not a great deal, certainly not enough to move them beyond the poverty line. There are limited savings. Uh, there's a little bit of employment, not a great deal. The people in the gardens are food secure in terms of not experiencing hunger. But based on a food diary exercise that we did, you see that they're not consuming vegetables, which is somewhat ironic since they're growing them and selling them. They do consume a little bit, but not very much. I'm still trying to understand why that is, but it seems that partly it's because it's a lot of work. And as we know, farming is a lot of work. So I've been told that you get home at the end of the day, you're exhausted. The last thing you want to do is spend time preparing vegetables. So you just cook something quick. There's also fairly low nutritional knowledge amongst the gardeners, and so uh, they think they're eating healthy diets even when they're not. Um, both the gardeners themselves and the people around them appreciate the access to fresh organic produce and especially to indigenous vegetables that are not always available in shops. At one garden, they even take requests. If someone lives nearby who comes from Malawi and they have some seeds from home and they want to grow something there, the, the people at the garden are happy to grow it. So they're providing access to foods you can't otherwise get. Um, we certainly do see localization. The customers at the gardens love the face-to-face -face interaction. They say how friendly and helpful everyone is at the gardens. And since they can sort of make requests on what's grown, you do get a little more control over the food system. Um, for many people, the garden is a social space. As one gardener told me, there's no better therapy than being in the garden. You can't be angry there. Um, so in neighborhoods where the accommodation tends to be small and cramped and there are not a lot of public spaces, the garden can provide one. And they also provide support for the vulnerable in their communities. While the gardeners themselves are by no means wealthy, they donate some of the food that they grow to orphanages or um, rehabilitation centers or soup kitchens. So they definitely have a role in their community. Um, just bringing it back to the question of food sovereignty, the top of that is the definition that I read to you earlier. And if I can just direct you to the very end of that slide. Food sovereignty implies new social relations free of oppression and inequality between men and women, peoples, racial groups, social and economic classes, and generations. So we are moving way beyond food security here, and we're talking about a transformation of social relations and a situation where people are not oppressed and not unequal so that they can actually be empowered to participate in decisions about their food system. So there are six principles that were developed on food sovereignty at a meeting in Mali in 2007. And I took those principles and tried to imagine what would it look like if they were applied to you know, food policies and support for food gardens in Johannesburg. And I think there's a second slide because this is not the latest one. So what would that look like? What would a food sovereignty approach look like in the case of Johannesburg's food gardens? The first principle is food for people. Food is a right, not a commodity. So First of all, that would mean rights education, because to date, every single gardener that I've asked in the city of Joburg has never heard of the right to food. They don't know that they have this right, they don't know what that right would entail, and they're certainly not about to go claim it since they don't know that it exists. Um, it would also mean that government support would have to focus on alternatives to the concentrated and corporate food sector, rather than just trying to get people into that food system. And it would have to focus on the nutritional value of food, not just increasing production of low nutrient staple foods. 
The second principle is that the system should value food providers, and that would mean that government support would have to focus on sustainable livelihoods and livable wages for people working in all elements of the food system. It would also mean a much greater focus on gender equality because as things stand now, so much work associated with food production and procurement and preparation is done by women and is therefore underpaid or unpaid. And the third principle is localizing food systems. So that would mean focusing on interventions that would bring producers and consumers together, like food gardens, like neighborhood farmers markets, and like having food gardens supply schools, clinics, and other institutions in their areas and in ways that would contribute to the local economy. Uh, the fourth principle is putting control of productive resources locally. That would mean that communities have control over decisions on what's done on land in their neighborhoods, uh, how water is used in their community. So it would be up to communities to decide whether there's a shopping center, a mining project, or local agriculture happening there. Um, fifth principle is builds knowledge and skills. Right now the government is very big on capacity building, but that means that outside experts are brought in to convey their expert knowledge to gardeners. And instead, in a food sovereignty approach, this would mean a much more horizontal approach, farmer to farmer knowledge sharing, building on people's existing knowledge and skills, and, and celebrating rather than ignoring indigenous knowledge. And the, the sixth principle is working with nature, and that would entail government support and training all being aligned to agroecology rather than dumping chemical products at food gardens for them to use. So that's sort of what I think a different and food sovereignty approach might look like. Um, a couple of quick lessons. Having the right to food is not enough. Um, so it's something really important to fight for, but then once you have it, you have to know you have it. Um, and you have to be able to claim it and be empowered. And government policies have to build on that right and seek to achieve that right, not just mention it in the introduction and then move on to something else. In terms of implementation, policies need resources, and that sounds so obvious, but they are adopted every day without any funding. So there need to be resources and there needs to be coordination between the different levels of government that are working towards the same goal so that they don't overlap or leave gaping holes in between their programs. Um, and finally, a food sovereignty approach rather than a food security approach, would immensely broaden the scope of food-related policies and shift the goals. And this means that government has to take questions like social transformation and empowerment seriously, rather than just looking at how many seeds are distributed to people. So thank you very much. And just so you know, this is what a farmer looks like in Johannesburg. This is Rafilwe, and she sends her greetings to you. bring our panel up, but while we do, we'd like to do the same exercise where you can have a few minutes conversation with your table generating some questions. There should be index cards still on the table. If you don't have any, let us know, and we'll come around in about three to five minutes to collect those. Okay, folks, we have our first question. This actually is for Ashley, though we will take comments from others if you have an opinion. Uh, Ashley. Why can't local health department audits be used for food banks and pantries? So I, I hope I understand the question. Is the question, why can't the local health inspectors audit the pantries? Whoever asked it? Um, if that is the question. Um, OK. I think because of the burden and because they're not required to. So like in North Carolina, they, ha they don't have any jurisdiction over the food pantries. The pantries are totally unregulated and allowed to do whatever they want. So it would be unlikely that the local health inspectors check them out. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a follow-up question, which is, I assume there are some pantries that are interested in more resources, but what resources do they have to go to? If they can. Oh, you set me up so nicely. They have my resources <laughs> to go to. Yeah. Um, so the food banks do provide um, some level of food safety training to the food pantries, but that is variable amongst food bank. 
Um, so some food banks are very good at providing a yearly training or um, uh, sending like regular recall information or sending out one of the food bank employees to go uh, like chat with and uh, offer expertise to the uh, food pantries, but that is not consistent across the state. Um, and so as a result of all this research, um, myself with Ben Chapman, who's the food safety extension specialist at North Carolina State University, we put together a series of videos that look at, um, uh, um, the first one is like general uh, food safety information. The second one is on time temperature control, um, hand washing and cross contamination within the pantry. The third one is on how to write your own standard operating procedures and learn about recalls. And then the last one, which is not particularly food safety related, though it came up a lot when I was visiting the food pantries, which is why it's okay to give out past state foods mm -hmm. from a food waste perspective. And because there are a lot of people who misconstrue uh, past state foods as being unsafe when they're just, right. Uh, right. Uh, they're not unsafe. Okay, Brittany, this is geared towards you. Uh, what obligation does a national state have to educate people about their right to food, and how should it happen? Uh, the disclaimer I'll offer is that I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> um, so I don't know exactly what obligation a national state would have to do that, but I know that in the case of South Africa, um, with the advent of democracy and the adoption of the new constitution, uh, in 1996, there was a massive effort in the early days to educate people about all of their rights. Um, so the Constitution was printed in all 11 official languages. It was distributed far and wide by government, community workers, NGOs, any and everyone. And there was a, a strong effort at rights education in the early days. And the concept of rights is quite strong in South Africa because it's a relatively new concept uh, for most people. So people are more empowered than they might be elsewhere in terms of knowing that they have rights. And, and people protest a lot in South Africa when they're denied their rights, if it's about water or education, um, access to land as well. But somehow the right to food as yet hasn't, hasn't resonated. People haven't heard about it. And even when the Human Rights Council has sought to raise the issue, people think of food as something that you buy with money that you earn. And, and understanding that it's a right um, is, is taking longer. So what that education would look like, I mean, I think it would involve going into schools and teaching children about rights in general and including the right to food specifically. Um, and certainly it would be great if we could go out into all of the, the gardens as well and empower food gardeners and farmers, not only in urban areas but everywhere, to understand that there's this right. So maybe something like that. Thank you. This is actually for each of you. Um, how do national, state, legal, and policy frameworks impact, assist, and hinder your work? <laughs> and we don't have a long time. <laughs> you want to start, Paul? Yes. Um, I guess, you know, I, I, work with, um, I work with the federal government through AmeriCorps, mm -hmm. and that's always a struggle. It's a, it's a blessing and a curse. Um, but I just roll with the feds. <laughs> just, just geological time frames mm -hmm. on decision making and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. I guess I'll, 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 I'll full stop. Full stop. Ashley, do you want to weigh in? So how, how, oh my God, I feel like there were mm -hmm. nine parts to the question. Yeah, so are there, um, we could say national or state frameworks, legal and policy frameworks that impact, assist, or hinder your work? Um, well, for the, food, for the food pantries in North Carolina, the, there is little uh, legal regulatory framework. Mm -hmm. However, the thing that drives the food pantries is the Good Samaritan Act, um, which essentially, as explained earlier, uh, allows the um, pretty much anybody to donate. And if in the event of some terrible food borne illness outbreak, the pantry would not be liable for that, which we would see as the probably end to that food pantry, especially if they're not responsible for it. Um, 
in terms of hindering my work, I don't, I don't know if, I don't think it hinders this work. <laughs> I'll say that. Okay. Um, okay, bizarrely, despite the right to food being enshrined in the South African constitution, there's no law on the right to food or on food security or food sovereignty or any other matter. What there is, is a heap of policy. So in terms of law, part of my work is advocating to have one um, so that it's easier to enforce. And then in terms of the policy framework, while the national level policies don't matter too much in terms of working in, in gardens in a city, the provincial, which would be like state, um, and local policies actually do help. And while they struggle and there are many challenges with implementation, the fact that they exist and that they're generally positive is a good thing. And so mostly I try to work with government to improve their implementation um, and find other actors um, like NGOs, companies, etc., who can help them to speed up and expand implementation. I, I have a, I mean, I have a positive, a high note here. You know, um, throughout my entire career, I've had really, really good luck and good relationships with Department of Labor, Department of Vocational Rehabilitation, um, services for, for in particular youth workforce development. Um, you know, for someone who's really tenacious, who's, who's very creative, and who knows how to spend money wisely, and who has a fiduciary responsibility to their partnership with, with, the, with those agencies, that well is a, is a fairly deep well. Um, and so, if someone knows how to make those connections, and knows how to be very prudent with their dollars as far as spending them properly on youth workforce development or even adult workforce development, that's a really good place to start with a project like the healthcare share. Um, so Vermont Department of Labor, the Federal Department of Labor, and Department of Vocational Rehabilitation and the like are, are very, very important partners for, for, for the VYCC in, in my program. Mm -hmm. This isn't entirely unrelated. There's a question here about have other programs that are similar to health care shares successfully leveraged insurance dollars? So have you ever had a conversation with an insurance company? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tell us about it. <laughs> it didn't go very far. But again, unabashed... Um, I think there are dollars there. I think there. I think that is where the consistent, reliable funds for these kinds of projects are. The mm -hmm. partnership between sustainable ag and healthcare is a very alluring one for, for um, insurance companies. Um, I think in the age of insurance reform, um, with incentives and so on and so forth, that's that's really where. Um, our future will be if there's a future for projects like this. Um, I don't, that's just not my wheelhouse. So I need someone who kn knows how to navigate those waters for free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Uh, how does race and local unrest affect access to the um, urban garden spaces? Um, race affects absolutely everything in South Africa. It's a, it's a given and it's, it's issue number one always. Um, urban unrest, <laughs> we have sort of a steady low amount of urban unrest, but it's rare that it flares up too much beyond that in a way that would affect access to the gardens. Um, obviously, the majority of the people who are poor, unemployed, and food insecure are black. Uh, that's what race looks like in South Africa. So it's also true that a lot of the food gardens in poorer areas are, of course, um, worked in and run by black people who are in those poor urban areas. Um, there aren't so many community garden projects in wealthy white areas, though there are some. They tend to not have a food security approach. Um, some of the organizations that support food gardens are in the wealthy white areas, but then they go into the other areas to support the food gardens. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering the spirit of the question, so if I'm not, please tell
tell me and I'll, I'll try again. <laughs> but um, it, it's just a given that, that race affects everything in Johannesburg. Okay. So I am going to go to about five after five, just disclaimer. I don't want you to be worried. We won't go longer than that. We have three more questions. Ashley, do you, did you encounter any qualitative benefits to eating unregulated foods? For, uh, for example, fresh produce from gardens, uh, home canned goods versus processed food through the TFAP. So qualitative be benefits of fresh food versus the processed food. That's not quite what you said. I heard you say <laughs> there was lower risk with, yeah, but so you tell us what you think. Okay, so to begin, TFAP is not only uh, processed foods. It does include um, frozen meat and frozen vegetables. So this last year they were getting a lot of bags of frozen chicken quarters and frozen blueberries. Um, it does also include, you know, uh, pasta and uh, peanut butter and uh, box milk and juice and stuff like that, which uh, I think we can say have varying levels of nutritional quality. Um, there is a lot of food that comes from uh, gardens, a um, little bit less that comes from uh, uh, home canned, certainly in terms of unregulated hunted game. Um, I saw a little bit of venison out there. Um, and then in terms of unregulated, also um, leftover prepared foods. So for example, if there was leftover food from lunch, it would get boxed up and someone might donate it. Um, this is not legal actually everywhere. It's totally fine in North Carolina, but it would be considered unregulated because we don't actually know how it is kept and stored along the way because um, it's kind of after, almost aftermarket. Mm -hmm. um, there are great benefits, I think we can say, to having fresh fruits and vegetables of any kind, um, but what we want to know is are the gardens that are donating doing all, of they, all that they can do to um, lower the risk of, uh, you know, pathogenic bacteria. Um, I know I'm not exactly answering qualitative benefits, but there are, I mean, there are lots of benefits. Well, it's a risk-benefit ratio because, right? Right. Okay. And I, I don't have a, like, a, I can't give you, like, a number or anything like that that, but there are certainly those benefits, but all supply chain actors have to do their part, essentially, is the issue. And the question is, are all supply chain actors doing their part to keep the food as safe as possible? Okay, I think we can do two rapid fire questions. Brittany, you're on, one minute or less. All right, um, how about urban soil structure and health? Does that affect the farmers and food production, and are there special practices that are needed to be used to enhance that soil? Great question. Um, the soils are no doubt incredibly contaminated. Uh, Joburg is essentially a mine dump. Uh, all around the city you can see mine dumps, the tailings that are left from gold mining, which was the origin of the city a little over 100 years ago. Um, there's acid mine drainage, which affects the water quality. Uh, the lead was only removed from the petrol less than 10 years ago, so there's lead pollution. We can't even begin to talk about the paint because nobody knows what's in the paint. So probably we shouldn't be eating from the food gardens. No one is testing the soil. No one is measuring the contamination. We literally don't know. Um, so it would probably affect them if anyone knew what was happening. Um, and we can only hope that it's not any worse than the official agricultural land, which also suffers a lot of those things. All right, this is the one near and dear to my heart, Paul. We have 30 seconds. <laughs> Does the healthcare share provide any training, parentheses, food preparation for participants to help those who don't know how to or who are physically incapable of cooking? Yes, um, so it, it, um, it differs from different health care clinics or healthcare care um, medical centers. Um, we partner with Hunger Free Vermont here in Vermont to provide um, the Learning Kitchen courses. We uh, have a partnership with them to provide eight of those courses. Over the last year or so, we've, we've really sort of refined our approach to that to really work with youth. We started out sort of, you know, come one, come all with our, our uh, learning kitchen classes. And we just realized we, we do 
um, youth classes or young adult classes. Um, at UVM Medical Center, why don't you speak to that? All right. So we have an innovative curriculum at all of our sites where we actually give recipes, food demos, and the tools that people need. Uh, to actually use their farm share, who has not come home with a daikon radish and wondered what to do with it. And so we have to be able to, you know, make the vegetable accessible, basically. And so we are, we are working with that. I think okay. it's also safe to say that when we started this, we, we, we got really important feedback from our healthcare provider partners that said, um, you know, and Olivia can, you know, remember when we, when we were really working on this in 2012, we focused on a July through, through October 1st share. And primarily that's because in June it's really difficult in Vermont to provide familiar vegetables. So our focus was to provide familiar vegetables to families that, that, um, that they could often eat raw or, you know, that children would, you know, be familiar with. So that's another piece to it is, is that the approach is, is less about unique vegetables and more about familiar vegetables with every week something new and then and then we really saturate the supplemental education around that vegetable okay minding the time so ends our panel thank you so much for being here thank you all for participating